Saudi Arabia, a mysterious desert country the size of Western Europe. It sits on a quarter of the world's oil reserves. It has always evoked images of wealth and luxury, often illustrated by the flamboyance of its royal family. But the world viewed Saudi Arabia differently after the morning of September 11, 2001. When it became clear that 15 of the 19 were Saudis, that was a disaster. Bin Laden at that moment had made in the minds of Americans Saudi Arabia into an enemy. The Saudi-U.S. relationship has been the backbone of the stability of the Saudi monarchy. This unlikely partnership has withstood every major crisis since the Second World War. America struck a pact with Saudi Arabia. You gave us oil at cheap prices and we will give you protection. But why then should the Saudi millionaire and 15 of his compatriots want to attack their country's main ally. The terrorist attacks have left nothing but unanswered questions. The one certainty is that the outside world knows little about this desert kingdom. Everything in this country revolves somehow around religion. The religion is part of the DNA, if you like, of the Saudis. The survival of the House of Saud has depended on its capacity to reconcile Islam and modernity. The events of September 11th brought to light the concealed struggle within Saudi Arabia. Can the House of Saud survive? understand today's events, one has to turn to the alliance that brought the House of Saud to power. Before the rule of the Al Saud, the desert heartland was governed by the whims of various tribal factions. The story of the House of Saud begins in 1744 with a Puritan Muslim preacher called Muhammad Abdul Wahab. He was determined to restore pure Islam to the heart of the Arabian desert. But his teachings, known as Wahhabism, could only be spread by the power of the sword. To achieve this, he needed the help of a hardened tribal warrior called Muhammad al Saud. This alliance of Islam and the sword gave birth to the first ever political entity in this desert wasteland. The first Saudi state crumbled a hundred years later, and the desert reverted to chaos until a descendant, Abdul Aziz, came along. In the country of Saudi Arabia, it was about and a small towns. There was a lot of violence, a lot of violence, and a lot of violence between these towns. It was not the only country of Saudi Arabia in its history. In this way, Abdul Aziz. In 1902, Abdul Aziz bin Saud, a great-grandson of the original founder, rode out with 40 of his brothers and cousins to restore the glory of their ancestors. The first step was to capture Riyadh, the ancient capital of the Saudi kingdom. He certainly had a vision. He had a, a, a large, big vision of what he wanted this country to be. He wanted it to be a nation, to be a state, like other states, to have hospitals, roads, uh, schools, factories, uh, all the elements of a modern state, and to take its place among the nations, rather than to be a forgotten backwater where nobody cares what they live or die, what's happening there, but to be a player in the international scene. To conquer the whole Arabian Peninsula, he needed the fighting skills of the Bedouins known as the Ikhwan. The Ikhwan, or the Muslim Brothers, were fervent Wahhabi Islamic Puritans. The Ikhwan were an important fighting force that supported the expansion of Ibn Saud. 
they had this vision that they propagated through Islam in its purest form. So anything they encountered that differed from that vision was regarded as objectionable. The nature of where they were coming from, the desert, uh, was isolated really for almost 800 years. In the desert you have either uh, day or night, you have uh, cold or hot, you don't have these shades. Even the music is only one string. And that has kind of polarized the, the way of thinking. It's either black or white, uh, it's either you're with me or against me. The Ikhwan troops were unstoppable, and thanks to them, Abdul Aziz captured province after province of this vast desert. He yearned to bring the coastal province of Hejaz and its capital Mecca under his rule. Mecca, the holiest site of Islam, would be his crown jewel. In 1926, the Ikhwan captured Islam's holiest shrine. With this final victory, he could no longer control them. When the battle stopped, the process of consolidating the state began. And here we have the problem, because they, the Ikhwan, could not be restrained. They wanted to create an empire, extending across all of the Muslim ummah. They would have, God knows where they would have stopped, maybe in France, <laughs> given the chance. But they couldn't do it. It was not possible. So when Ibn Saud tried to restrain them and ask them not to launch attacks into these territories, they rebelled. They revolted against him. And they accused him of being uh, an infidel, of having abandoned the uh, faith of Islam and becoming worldly and uh, all that kind of thing. They said, why Ibn Saud sent his kids or ch children or own sons abroad to London to this is against Islam. Why we had the new technology coming, wireless station, whatever, this is against Islam. If you, if you look at these things, these are against the project of Ibn Saud. So he said, these things I cannot accept. This is not my agenda. King Abdul Aziz was in a fix. If he was to realize his vision of a modern state, he needed to destroy his loyal warriors, the Ikhwan. How could he, the defender of Islam, justify going to war against his Muslim allies? His only way out was to win over the religious establishment, the ulama. They were regarded as the moral guardians of the kingdom. Walajaa. <laughs> إلى رجال الدين في الرياض وقال أنتم الحكم أحكموا بيني وبين هؤلاء فنظروا في الشارع الإسلامية أعادوا النظر ودققوا في القرآن وفي الأحاديث وجدوا أن الحق مع الملك عبد العزيز وليس مع فأعطوا الفتوى المشهورة بأنه أنتم غلطانين ولا يجوز لكم شرعا أنكم تقوموا بهذه الحركات ضد ولي الأمر so from that moment, they actually changed their role, the ulama, and they became uh, almost uh, like a force to be used to sanction politics. And that was the crucial moment in 1927. The al-Saud have since perfected the art of compromise. The blessings of the ulama and their power to issue fatwas remain the cornerstone of Saudi rule. The ulama gave the green light for King Abdul Aziz to crush his warriors. But the Ikhwan were only subdued, not eradicated. Their descendants or their admirers have resurfaced at every critical juncture in Saudi history. King Abdul Aziz could now move ahead with his project. In 1932, he officially gave the new state his family name, Saudi Arabia. But maintaining the unity of this vast desert was a difficult task. Marriage was one of the answers, 
the king married a daughter of every tribal chief in the areas he conquered. He produced 45 legitimate sons. Every Saudi king has been a son of the original founder. Building a state from scratch required money. The country's only income came from the pilgrimage tax in Mecca. But that was not enough. King Abdelaziz was in the desert, saw an old lady, and the old lady was crying, and uh, found out that she had nothing, literally nothing. So he used to have under his seat in the car bags of money, because people are poor, and there is no way to distribute, to, to distribute money in the system. There was no system. So he grabbed a bag of coins, you know, like 50 rials, good hefty sum, and gave it to the lady. And, uh, and the lady started hitting the ground. And she prayed, and she said, may God open the treasures of the earth for you. And this was before the discovery of oil. King Abdelaziz was aware that neighboring states like Iran and Kuwait had discovered natural resources that brought them great wealth. But his kingdom was less developed, and his primary concern was water. An American philanthropist called uh, uh, Mr. Crane. Mr. Crane actually came to, to Saudi Arabia, and he saw King Abdelaziz. And King Abdelaziz was complaining about the lack of availability of water in the country. He wasn't looking for oil. So it is by chance that we discovered oil. We were looking for water. And this feat happens until today. Every time we look for water, we find oil. <laughs> but oil was to prove a very mixed blessing. The only way to reap the benefits of this discovery was to invite foreign companies. King Abdelaziz feared that inviting non-Muslims would be criticized by the religious establishment. A compromise had to be found. The king asked the companies to come. One of the scholars challenged that. He said the King bin Saud is doing something against Islam. So the king knew about this and he asked the scholar to come to his uh, court. When he came, he said, I want you to give me an example why I shall not do that. He said, this is against Islam. He said, prove to me. Prophet Muhammad Sallam used Jews, used Christians. He did not say, these are not Muslim, I cannot be in touch with them, I cannot use, utilize them. Didn't use, he, the Prophet used them? The, the scholar said, yes. He said, I'm doing that the same. Abdul Aziz, in the history, من تدخلات بعض الجالدين جماعهم كلهم في 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 مقر الحكم في الرياض وقالهم اشبعوا إذا تدخلت في شؤون الدولة أنتم الآن على راسي هذه الطريقة النجدية لكن والله لو تدخلت في شؤون الدولة لهزيت راسي وكلكم وقعتوا في الأرض نحن لا نريد ازدواجية في الدولة كل واحد يكون دولة ما الناس صارت فوضى الدولة واحدة أنتم لكم مكانتكم ولكم نصيحتكم ولكم فتاواكم ولكم مكانتكم ولكم أن تبدون النصح وتبدون الأمور عن خلال أنا يا النظام أنا رئيس النظام. In 1933, the first foreign oil prospectors started arriving in the kingdom. King Abdul Aziz did not care which country got the concession as long as they put down the money first. The British, the Japanese, and many others showed interest, but it was the Americans who put down the cash. The Arabian American Oil Company, or Aramco, was created for the sole purpose of prospecting and marketing the oil of Saudi Arabia. The shareholders of Aramco were America's four largest oil corporations. There were no Saudi shareholders. The first number of holes was dry. And the question was, why should we continue with this? They had been ordered to stop and they'd 
fail to read their mail or whatever, and and so they did strike the oil, and and that well uh, is today is is operating. When King Abais uh, went there to open the first oil field, and he smelled the sulfur, and he it, he was repugnantly uh, surprised by the smell, and uh, they told him, "But Your Majesty, this is." Uh, what oil, the sulfur of oil smells like. So, oh, oh, let me smell more of it. When the Americans came to the Eastern Province with the Aramco Company, they had to live in a compound area. Inside, they have their own condition, situation, like in the United States. Outside, they have to live with the Saudis as the tradition exists. They started building these camps. It was new to us. The air conditioning was new to us. All these things. And then what was good about Aramco is they shared it. They used to get canned food. We've never seen canned food at the time. And we used to fight over uh, who takes the, can, the empty cans, because these, these are toys for us as kids. So we were always glad to see the Americans come in, and especially the chewing gum. I mean, the chewing gum was a, a big contributing factor of liking. I remember the first time when we had a refrigerator that was supplied by, by Aramco to a number of people. One, my, my father was one of them. We as kids were sitting there, must be 16 hours, to, to see how ice is going to be formulated within this refrigerator. Of course, it took 16 hours because every time we open the refrigerator, it, it loses its freezing impact. So we were absolutely was magic when we saw a cube of ice. We didn't know, really know, know the world of technology. We just thought it was different and, uh, and it, is the, it is America. For the U.S. administration, access to cheap oil had not been a top priority before 1945. But the Second World War changed many things. Oil jumped to the top of the list of American national security interests. For President Franklin Roosevelt, the Saudi monarch was now an important ally he needed to court. Franklin Delano Roosevelt had gone to Yalta, and on his way back from Yalta, he had decided he wanted to meet with King Abdulaziz and thank him, really, for throwing in with the Allies during World War II. Roosevelt <laughs> أتى عبد الله السليمان وزير مالية لزوجاته فقط مسلبناته وقال عبد العزيز سلم عليك ويقول أنا في البحر في طريقي أن أقابل روزفلت وسوف أعود خلال يومين ثلاثة Any royal trip like this has to be big. And it's not just for a show, no. It's like, you know, unifying all portions of the society with you together. So he had his own advisors. He has some of his own sons, princes. He had some of his tribal chieftains at the time. So it's, it's like a small state moving outside its own state to meet Roosevelt, and it has to be, you know, from portions of all portions of society. a very interesting meeting. Here's Roosevelt in his wheelchair, and as you know, he's not a big man, and he's in a wheelchair, and he's on, on, on the deck of the Quincy. And uh, King Abdelaziz, who you know is about six foot three and six foot four big, stricken with trachoma, not seeing too good, but walking with a cane. 
and these two hit it off right away. King Abdelaziz started kidding Roosevelt about, you're lucky you're in that wheelchair. They, you can wheel yourself anywhere. He said, I have trouble getting. And Roosevelt said to him, if you like this wheelchair so good, I'll, I have an extra one here, I'll give it to you. After exchanging niceties, they got down to business. Three main topics were on the agenda. Oil, whether the US could lease a military base in Saudi Arabia, and the tricky question of Palestine. Roosevelt said to him, Your Majesty, you know, I have a, I have a, I'd like to get your opinion on a, on, a, on a problem that I'm facing back home. He said, you know, a lot of my constituents are pressuring me to recognize the Jewish homeland in Palestine. And he said, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. And King Abdelaziz said, now, Mr. President, what Hitler did to the Jews was a terrible thing. It really it was the worst thing that man could do to man. But he said, I don't understand why you're talking about taking land away from us, the Arabs, and giving it to the Jews. We didn't do anything to the Jews. If you want to do something for the Jews, why don't you give them the best part of Germany? When he heard the position of King Abdelaziz about this issue, he said, I could promise you one thing. The promise that I could make is that I will not do or make any decision if I don't consult with your side and with the Jewish side. Both sides have to be consulted in order to reach one decision. This was the first in a string of broken promises. Palestine would from then on become the main source of tension in the Saudi-US friendship. But for the moment, King Abdelaziz was more concerned with the security of his kingdom. He requested American military assistance and training. President Roosevelt agreed to construct the Dahran military base. In return, the king guaranteed that the U.S. would always have secure access to Saudi oil. America struck a pact with Saudi Arabia, and the deal was very simple. You gave us oil at cheap prices, and we will give you protection. This protection eventually evolved into an American hegemony over the entire Gulf region, and the deal extended to the Gulf region, that this was an American area of influence, and in return for this, it shall be protected from all enemies. King Abdelaziz and the American president exchanged letters confirming their mutual commitments. But Roosevelt died shortly after sending this letter, and he was replaced by Harry Truman. Two years later, the United Nations met to vote on the partition of Palestine. Prince Faisal, the king's second son, arrived in New York confident that Roosevelt's promise would be upheld by his successor. Prince Faisal discussed this with George Marshall, Truman's Secretary of State. Faisal felt that Marshall had given him an assurance at the United Nations that we would take some other action. There was talk of a trusteeship. It would have been the first trusteeship under the United Nations Charter. And that Marshall had promised him that and that we had failed to do so. When the partition plan was announced, the United States was the first to back it. Prince Faisal regarded this as a betrayal of trust, a sentiment that would stay with him all his life. But his father, King Abdelaziz, was more preoccupied with the security of the kingdom. The king made his views very clear, including his sense of disappointment. But his main concern at that time was encirclement. 
Uh, he felt that with the Hashemites in Iraq and in Jordan and the British in Kuwait and the Gulf states that he was encircled. So the sense that there were hostile elements around the country coveting its riches and counting upon its internal weakness, its limited ability to defend itself, hence it needed an outside protector. So he looked to us more and more. And this particular security track, which became stronger and stronger over the years, outweighed the king and the Saudi government's unhappiness with our policy with respect to Israel and the Palestinians. At the age of 70, King Abdelaziz had accomplished his dream. He had restored the kingdom of his ancestors and ensured its survival, albeit through an alliance with a non-Muslim power. By 1952, the ailing king had started to transfer power to his elder sons. His first son, Prince Saud, had accompanied him in battle and was in close touch with the different tribes. He was in charge of internal affairs. His second son, Prince Faisal, was Minister of Foreign Affairs. <laughs> وقال لهم في اتفاقكم ووحدتكم فيها الشمارية لملك عبد العزيز والحفاظ على عائلتكم وعلى وحدة بلدكم ورخاء لا تختلفون يا ويلكم إذا تفرقتم فانتقل الملك بشكل سلس وشكل طبيعي أنا حضرته When King Abdelaziz died, people were afraid of what's going to happen next. He was the force. He was the, the symbol. He was almost the bureaucracy himself. Everything has to come through his desk because it was a nation that he... It's a startup, like a corporation today. You find the entrepreneur who starts a corporation, uh, they've got their hands on things. King Abdelaziz was, was a power and he was strong and he, was, he brought strength to the Roman age. You could see what he did, bringing the country together. Saud, on the other hand, people that dealt with him never considered him bright. I don't recall anything substantive that Saud ever said. Uh, on whatever the issues might be. Very pleasant, very nice, but inconsequential. He loved the trappings of being king. The palaces and the adulation of the crowds, the foreign dignitaries would come and talk to him, and uh, all of his retainers, of course, acting uh, uh, with due respect. And uh, so, I mean, he loved being king. The major critique of King Saud's policy was money. Because of his love of people, he wants to give out. He said, I give out because we have a belief. If you give out in the right sense, then you will, your God will give you more. There was no authority whatsoever in the financial. It was a total chaos. Anyone who wanted to dip into the till could dip into the till. And the privy purse didn't mean beans, because if he, if he ran out of privy purse, he dug into the uh, general purse. Money was tight, but King Saud could always count on his American friends at Aramco for a steady flow of cash. the king became a regular visitor to the oil-rich province, which was the source of his kingdom's revenue. The Saudis were interested in one thing, and that is that their oil industry was preserved and being handled in a way that where they could negotiate and they could increase the oil prices and so on. And they had extremely good relations with Aramco. 
they were making a lot of money, but they were spending it foolishly. The country was broke. They had to borrow money. They borrowed money from Aramco. Saud was much criticized for his financial chaos. But little was known about his other weaknesses. We had a, a vice president for Aramco whose name was Floyd Oliga. And he was with the king one time, and the king was tired. He was sick, and Oliga said to him, Your Majesty, why don't you go out into the desert, do a little hunting and relax, and we have a wonderful guest house. So uh, they, they thought that was a good idea. When the king landed, one of the things they were unloading from the plane was liqueur and, and, uh, and uh, hard whiskey. Well, we took a look at this, and, and, uh, and where did they put the stuff? They put the stuff under the king's bed in the guest house. So we, of course, we were kind of shocked. You know, here he is, he's head of the temperance league. And uh, During the stay, we could see that they were drinking the stuff kind of neat in these little tea glasses, like they, they, they look like miniature beer jug, you know, the, that they used to drink tea out of? They would drink this stuff straight. So he, we discovered with this, but it was kept very quiet. King Saud's drinking problems were hushed up for political reasons. The Saudi king was an important asset for the Americans. Since Gamal Abdel Nasser's coup d'etat in Egypt, the balance of power in the region had changed. Nasser's rapprochement with the Soviet Union was a serious source of worry. The Cold War was at its peak, where you had two mighty empires battling out across the whole planet, destroying nations in their, in their path. And you had the end of colonialism and these newly liberated countries coming out full of vitality, full of energy, and wanting to prove themselves. And the theme was out with the old, in with the new. Who cares whether the old was good or bad? It doesn't matter. We want to change. Khalas, we want to change and get everything new. So in this kind of environment, we are who are quintessentially old. You know what I mean? Uh, we were the odd ones out. We were going against this, the, 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 the trend. We didn't want to be part of that uh, new thinking in terms of socialism, communism. We've already had our ism. We've already had Islam. We were happy, and we united around Islam. And anything that would have come to Saudi Arabia would have unraveled the country. Nasser was the Soviet Union's friend in the region. Americans feared that his popularity would encourage the spread of communism. Conveniently, the Saudis were fervent anti-communists for religious reasons. Saudi Arabia is absolutely a linchpin, a key to our relationship in the whole area. So oil is at the very center uh, of that, and the, 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 the Russian power coming down there and having control of those oil fields would have been a major, major blow to us. The Eisenhower administration had the idea that perhaps King Saud could be built up in a political fashion that might make him a contender with Nasser in terms of leadership in the Arab world. In February 1957, King Saud was the first Saudi monarch to be invited to America on a state visit. The White House said, uh, we are inviting his majesty and eight of his uh, retinue. And <laughs> we took that to the king and particularly to his advisors. They looked at us and we looked at them and there was to be no way it would only be eight. Well, uh, one thing led to another and uh, by the time they got on the ship, there were about 80. The 
the news headlines gave prominence to the king's anti-Jewish sentiments. That did not go down well in New York. The mayor refused to welcome the king. President Eisenhower was determined to rectify the snub. Eisenhower met him at the airport, which was very, very unusual, and he just determined that he uh, was going to treat Saud as his great good friend. The main purpose of the trip was to renew the lease on the Dahran Air Base. But the Cold War had made Dahran a strategic U.S. asset against the Soviets and their friends in the region. Moreover, King Saud really wanted the money the U.S. would pay to extend the lease. My father at the time, you know, was uh, negotiating uh, the, the, the agreement. He was uh, uh, very sensitive to not calling it a base. It was a transit place for the Americans to take fueling, period. The exact details of the Dahran Agreement are revealed in this original copy of the Accord. This agreement still constitutes the basis of the U.S.-Saudi military cooperation. We had the right to bring in aircraft without asking permission. It was a Saudi air base, not an American air base, but we had usage rights. In exchange for our free use of the Dahran airfield, they wanted all kinds of uh, material. They wanted tanks, for one thing, and they wanted training for their, uh, and they wanted planes, and they wanted uh, anything we would give them. This agreement was celebrated with great pomp. King Saud was given the full honors. The official visit was glittering and fine. When it was all over, one sort of felt, you know, what is this all about? Because he's clearly not the man for this. Eisenhower's plan to build up Saud as the alternative Arab leader to the pro-Soviet Nasser seemed doomed to fail. But for Saud, old habits die hard. The revenue from the Dahran lease did not go towards helping the country out of its financial crisis. Instead, he squandered a good deal of the money on luxury trips to Europe. The big issue was the running of the government. That was the biggest problem. It was all personal. I mean, to, uh, let me give you an example. The government salaries were paid from his private purse. There was no distinction between government funds and personal funds of the king. It was all one. So this, you cannot run a modern state in this manner. King Saud's incompetence was embarrassing. To avoid a public family feud, Crown Prince Faisal withdrew from government. But the quarrel between the brothers, which their father had warned them against, was crippling for Saudi Arabia. And the family gradually said, you know, this is, this is getting pretty sticky. It was becoming very clear 
that Saud was really uh, not uh, cutting the mustard and that he would be, uh, he had not only bankrupted the, but he had these wild ideas. One of them was to try to knock off Nasser. And that was a total botch. We were, we were really worried about Saudi Arabia. I and mean, I'm not talking just about Aramco. I'm talking about the people in the US government and everybody were worried about Saudi Arabia and we realized that if anybody was going to save Saudi Arabia, it was going to be Faisal. A lot of people worried, as we did, living in Riyadh, that there'd be a kind of a civil war. The 20-odd Al Saud brothers active in politics realized that something had to be done. The step of removing a monarch is something that is not likely taken by anyone. It is a very serious, very dangerous step. Removing one monarch, well, you can always remove another. The most important constituencies in this country are the royal family, the ulama, and the business community and merchants. And it was important that all three of them reach the consensus that this step must be done. So the brothers all got together, all of them. It was their own best interest, too. They had to make a move. And they decided in November of 64 to go to the religious leaders, and uh, they decided this is the way they could do it. And they got a fatwa from the religious leaders sanctioning the abdication and sanctioning Faisal's taking over the throne. Once more, the Saudi monarchy was saved from the brink of disaster by the ulama. King Saud and his entourage were quietly asked to leave the country. Saud was just expunged from the royal line. When you went to a palace or any place, they would show Ablaziz and then Faisal and then Khalid. Saud never appeared on those pictures as though he didn't exist. In bad physical shape, the Saudi monarch spent his last years exiled in Greece. first year at Georgetown, 1964, I was called in by the dean of the, uh, of the university, uh, who when I went in the office, I thought I had done something wrong or something. And he said, well, now, Turkey, Annie, your situation has changed, and are you thinking that perhaps we could provide you with, with some bodyguards? In those days, there was no internet, there was no instant news service. To me, I had absolutely no idea that on that day, Monday, that my father had, uh, had become king. King Faisal faced serious challenges. His kingdom was no more than a sandbox. There were hardly any roads, schools or modern institutions. He wanted to modernize, but the question was how to do so without endangering the traditional Islamic values of Saudi Arabia. Essentially, modernity means westernization. This is the fact. It's a, like a buzzword, okay? Modern means westernized. This is where we have problems because people want to run their lives better, but not necessarily sacrificing their own culture and their own history in order to become copies of Frenchmen or copies of the English or false Americans. They don't want that. Faisal could handle the Olimat because he knew as much about uh, Islam as any of them did, and they knew that. And it was in that way that Faisal was able to establish much of his, his modernization. 
he decided that there should be uh, girls' schools in Saudi Arabia, and there was an uproar about it. All the old fathers came along and said this was awful. They, who knew what would happen when the girls got education? And Faisal said, in that case, don't send your daughters to the schools. Uh, and if you don't want, if a majority of people in your village or town don't want a girls' school, you won't have one. And, uh, but those who do want to have a school must have one. I would have been illiterate if they didn't have um, uh, schools at the time. And in fact, I was lucky to go to one of the early private schools that were established in the 60s. Female education was put under the directory of a separate body that would control the curriculum uh, and make sure that what the girls are taught in schools uh, is actually suitable for them as girls and as women. So in that way, um, he managed to reconcile uh, the need for female education and also the requirements of the ulama. Gradually, indeed, the number of girls' schools was increased and, and girls were admitted to universities and so on. All this was done by keeping just a little way ahead of public opinion and always being willing to stop and wait for public opinion to catch up. But finding grounds for compromise with the ulama was a constant battle. The religious scholars and the religious police made it their business to safeguard Islamic morality down to the most minute details of daily life. Well, one day, I get a telephone call from our people in Dharan and says, Mike, they're banning vanilla. The vanilla extract is being banned. I said, why? He said, well, it's got a little alcohol in it. And, and, you know, they're going crazy. You know, anything with anything, any alcohol in it, anything. And, and they're saying to me, look, we can't make ice cream, we can't make bread, we can't make cakes, we can't... Well, it's a great problem. We've got to do something about it. <laughs> so, I happen to be in one of my visits to the king, and I'm saying, telling him about this, and, uh, and he was amazing. He was amazing, really. He picks up the phone, and the vanilla was allowed in. But it wasn't always easy for King Faisal to win the ulama over to his point of view. They, they consider that uh, broadcasting television is a sin and against uh, because they consider them to be images. And we are not supposed to show images. And they consider that this was uh, rank heresy and that the government had become uh, in league with the devil. <laughs> So what he did is he had somebody recite the Quran and broadcast that and told people, you see this, it can be evil, it's like a sword. You can use a sword for good or you can use the sword to assassinate. So it's a tool, really. It's like the internet today, the same debate goes on. I remember sitting in front of the TV for two or three hours, the first time they put the signal, you know, they have that signal they put and the music going on, or they had Quran, they didn't have music, they had Quran, and the, the signal. I would just sit there in front of the TV watching the signal, <laughs> seeing the TV. I remember that. But some conservative members of the royal family disagreed with the sleep towards modernity. In 1965, King Faisal was faced with a crisis that would have drastic consequences for him personally. One of Faisal's brother's son staged a demonstration, Prince Khalid ibn Sa'ad, in 1965. And uh, this demonstration was objecting to the introduction of television on the basis that it was un-Islamic. A group of, of, uh, of people who got together, not numbering more than a hundred. They headed towards the, the television tower in, in Riyadh and tried to break in to bring down the television tower. They fired at the guards, the guards fired back and the prince was killed. The father then went to Faisal and said, uh, you've got to punish the soldier who killed my son. And Faisal said, no. Uh, I'm sorry your son was killed, but he was breaking the law. He fired on the police. They fired back at him, and the policeman is guiltless. He said, you have to take action against his officer. And Faisal said, I will not take action against his officer. 
I am responsible. And that had tragic consequences because the brother of this young prince who was killed after 10 years, he was the one then who killed Faisal. The outbreak of the 1967 Arab-Israeli war overshadowed all of King Faisal's internal troubles. Israel won the war in six days and left the bulk of Arab armies destroyed. It also occupied four times more territory than it had acquired at its creation. It was a devastating effect that, that the defeat in 67 had on all of us. For King Faisal, it was a particular wound because uh, throughout his career, from 1919, when he was 14 years old, and went to represent his father at the peace conference in Paris after the First World War, until 1967, that's nearly 50 years, that he was personally representing the kingdom uh, in defense of the Palestinian people and Palestinian territory. And now, in 1967, to see that the rest of Palestine including the jewel of, of, of Jerusalem, had been taken over by, by the Israelis. He, he felt a personal uh, loss and, uh, and a personal uh, affront, if you like, to all his efforts throughout his life. After 1967 and the fall of uh, Jerusalem to the Israelis, uh, that was a turning point in his life. He never smiled again. Arabs thought that the United States was not an innocent bystander in this conflict. Its weapons had secured the victory. After the war, there was a violent backlash against American interests in various Arab capitals. I got orders almost immediately from Washington to move out the American community. And I went to see Faisal right away. Faisal said it's very important that we retain close diplomatic relations, that the American community remain. And his concern then was that the United States press Israel, do something to press Israel to get out of the West Bank, Gaza and Sinai and East Jerusalem, which we promised to do. For the moment, the American commitment was appreciated. But King Faisal had not forgotten that a similar promise was made to his father and never kept. Being friends with the U.S. was, was, was difficult. It was difficult because of this Palestinian problem. But so after 67, it got real, it got real tough. You know, the only reason the Arabs got the beat, their beaten was in the Arab world because of the American air coverage and all that, and that's the only reason they beat us. So the Arab League got together and, and, and said to the Saudis, you, you people are nothing but a bunch of American stooges. You don't even control your own oil. Between 1960 and 1970, this is a period of 10 years, the price of oil in the market did not go up one cent. Not one single cent. I uh, discovered that the value of an equivalent barrel of Pepsi Cola was more expensive than an oil barrel at the time. <laughs> By the early 70s, Saudi Arabia had become increasingly aware of the strategic importance of its natural resource. Oil was the only real weapon that could pressure the West. For six years, King Faisal tirelessly warned the US administration that they had to live up to their promise. They had to find a solution to the conflict before it was too late. The tension in the Middle East was brewing indeed. Uh, however, the 
I don't think that we fully recognized how much it was brewing. We tended to uh, downplay the uh, statements that came out of the Middle East, and most notably the letter that was received from King Faisal. And that letter said, you must do something about the Palestinian problem or there will be a deterioration. And we tended to, at that time to think that that was uh, just some more hot air on the part of the king. In October 1973, the Fourth Arab-Israeli War broke out. The Arab attack on Israel came as a total surprise. Within the first week, the Egyptian army had gained considerable ground. The Israelis pressed us with regard to the running down of their supplies. And uh, the administration did not wish to um, be seen to be responsible for the collapse of Israel. Uh, the uh, Arab states, Syria and Egypt, were armed with Soviet weapons. The president took the view that we do not want to see a triumph of Soviet weaponry over American weaponry. Israel was running low on equipment, so the U.S. decided to send in an airlift while the war was still going on. King Faisal was outraged. I got the phone call uh, the morning after the, the airlift and uh, asked to come to Riyadh to see the king as soon as I could, which went now. And the king was furious uh, about this. He saw no way to do anything but to boycott. I said to him, I, I just really don't see how you're going to do it. And the king just simply said, you are going to do it. On October 17, 1973, Saudi Arabia, the world's largest oil producer, withdrew huge quantities of oil from the world market. The sudden shortage quadrupled the price of oil, sending the world economies into a spin. King Faisal had made his point, and the U.S. administration realized that it could no longer ignore his demands. By using oil as a weapon, King Faisal had changed the nature of international relations. You can see the second part of House of Saud tomorrow at nine here on BBC Four. Next tonight, the colourful life of one of the first women to report on war from the front line. The story of high-profile, high-society Martha Gellhorn, told by friends and family in a moment.